put that little thing on there. They can't see the screen. Being recorded. Big time. We are being recorded. Woo. Big time. Big time. Big time. Welcome to episode 85 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. <laughs> anyway. And you were saying? <laughs> Take two. Welcome to episode 85 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. Tonight, I am joined by the guy who is not only the general manager of the Born Braves, but also the untapped hero for getting to over 2,000 beers while we were on vacation. I'm his co-host, Mary, who has just over 830 beers on Untapped. So, Darren, in reference to this episode, you're basically Buford, and I'm like fucking Pleasanton, except I can't exaggerate my beers like Pleasanton exaggerated his battle reports. But your 800 beers are today. That could put you ahead, though. So there you go. That would so- be a Pleasanton thing to do. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that guy, Darren, he might have over 2,000 beers, but guess what? I drank my 800 today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good, damn right, damn right, damn right. So what's going on? It's been, so anyway, I'm Darren, and it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded this. So I want to do introductions. We're on the go around the room and introduce ourselves again, because it's been a while. You can bust out your IPA girl again, your introduction from the very first episode. I'm an IPA girl? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so no what's going on? Said- so we've a lot of shenanigans under our foot since last time we did this, but you know, we, we did to travel around a little bit, have a good time. So but we're back in the saddle, literally and figuratively. Ooh, See what I did there? That's a segue. Anyway, we are talking about the horsies today, Mary. The horsies. Horsies. Talking about all kinds of fun stuff. But before we get started. Right. Yes. Because I'm hosting and you're making me look mm-hmm. like a bad host right now for not asking that. What are you drinking mm-hmm. tonight, sir? Oh, thanks for asking, Mary. I appreciate it. Um, I am drinking. It's called... Uh, Water, watercolors replay. I can't read it because it's whatever. Bought at the and amazing I'm, craft beer cellar in Plymouth, Massachusetts. You did, you did, and it's out of my Iron Brigade mug because this isn't really an Iron Brigade battle per se, but you know the sec the second Wisconsin is here, and this is there's some people we're going to talk about here. They're going to mention this, so that's what I'm doing. So that being said, um, I will do the honors and ask you what you were drinking. Oh, thank you. Aren't you a gentleman? Um, oh, I do my best. <laughs> I am drinking um, IPA number 21 by Collective Arts Brewing out of Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, it is a milkshake IPA, and I'm drinking it out of my Seminary Ridge Museum mug because it has Buford on it, and Buford is part of this battle that we're going to be talking about tonight. And also just a bit of a shout out to the Seminary Ridge Museum as well, because they do awesome things over there in Gettysburg. And if y'all find yourself in Gettysburg, definitely go pay them a visit and take the cupola tour. Okay, very cool, very cool. So today, we are talking about the Battle of Brandy Station, which I don't know if you know this, but you probably don't. Today is the actual anniversary as we record this, Mary. Today uh, is June who was 9th. the one that told you that earlier? Um, I knew this, okay. But thanks for bringing it up again. But it's also known as the Battle of Fleetwood Hill, and we're going to talk yes. about that as well. Today is the anniversary, so... Um, you know, we, we have to set the stage here a little bit, a little bit about it. You know, it's, it is that Gettysburg campaign month, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we've yep. been saying throughout the silly little podcast thing we do that to understand the overall large battle, in this case, Gettysburg, you really need to look at that big picture, right? And look at the events that led up to in this case, in the battle of Gettysburg. It's really mm-hmm. necessary, you know, to look at how the armies got there, right? And to that point, the battle of Brandy station is very necessary to do this because, the Battle of Brandy Station really is important for a bunch of reasons, okay? Um, it, the, the most important one is it was a huge, and we'll talk about this, it is a huge psychological change of how the Confederate cavalry was perceived versus how the Union one was, right? Mm-hmm. And this would pay huge dividends for the Union and kind of remove that era of uh, that invincibility away from the rebel horsemen, specifically that of Jeb Stuart, their commander. Yes, it would, and... It's, it's one of these ones that, you know, as you say, like it, you know, all these little battles leading to Gettysburg, like last year at this time, we recorded second Winchester, which is basically, it's kind of like that gateway to Gettysburg without second Winchester. You can't, you you probably wouldn't have Gettysburg happen in a way. Brandy station is like that too. Um, And we're, we'll talk about that at the end, but yeah, this is the one where, you know, going into this battle, like the, the uh, Confederate cavalry clearly has the upper hand. And, you know, Jeb Stewart leads them. He's done his ride around McClellan in 1862, basically humiliated them by doing that. And, you know, Stewart's got this reputation and it's, it's a pretty good reputation that he's got. And I, um, I have a quote from none other than Oliver Otis Howard. That's 
Who? Yeah, I know. Oh, um, he said, Jeb Stewart was cut out for, for a cavalry leader in perfect health, but 32 years of age, full of vigor and enterprise with his usual ideas in Virginia concerning state supremacy, Christian in thought and temperate by habit. No man could ride faster, endure more hardships, make a livelier charge, or be more hardy and cheerful while so engaged. A touch of vanity, which invited the smiles and applause of the fair maidens of Virginia, but added to the zest and ardor of Stuart's parades and achievements. And this is what Howard writes in his memoirs. And this is before the Battle of Brand like, you know, he's he's writing this in the lead up to the Battle of Brandy Station. So mm -hmm. this is what we have here is a very what's considered strong Confederate cavalry. And the Union is kind of, you know, it's kind of like this bumbling thing that doesn't have itself together, but that is yeah, going to we, change at the end of this battle. Right. We'll, we'll talk about that. That's going to be the primary thing about this, but just kind of set the stage where we are at this time. So you mentioned, you mentioned Chancellorsville, mm -hmm. the Confederacy to your point is riding high after Chancellorsville yep. after that, that big victory in May of 1863 is arguably Robert E. Lee's greatest victory. Um, although he would disagree because Joseph Hooker got away and the army of Potomac was, was able to fight for another day. Now, Men and supplies were having a difficult time being replaced in the Army of Northern Virginia. And so Lee needed to resupply. And if he wanted to continue fighting and keep the war going into 63 and beyond later, he had to supply. So to that point, Lee knew he needed to get out of Virginia. He just knew, right? Mm -hmm. His army was starving hungry. The farmers of the state were completely barren because really the Union occupied the state for a couple of years now. This is the third, yep. third summer of the war here. Lee knew that he had to take his show on the road again, and this time to go into the north, but specifically Pennsylvania. And this will lead to the Gettysburg campaign. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, Gettysburg's got two, T two DQs all right by itself. I mean, think about the supplies they have, right? <laughs> but he knew going into the north um, was also going to create a lot of anxiety in, in that northern press yep. it, with the inhabitants. I mean, if he could draw the Union Army out while he's hunting for supplies and somehow get them to, to fight and beat them on their soil, that could create a lot of pressure from the Northern press on Lincoln to try to sue for peace with the Confederacy. Now, yep. we've said many, many times, that's that's the window dressing. The real part, the whole purpose of this is supplies. This Yeah, it's Gettysburg a huge grocery shopping trip. He's he's going he's mission. going to the Costco, okay. basically. It's like you got nothing in the cupboard. You got to get up in the morning. Ah, oh, crap, I got to go to the store. That's what this thing was, okay? And it'll be later, of course, be known as the Gettysburg Campaign. It'll begin on June 3rd, 1863, when Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is going to slip away from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and to begin to move north. Now, they're going to roll into a place called Culpeper County. Now, it's a boot. 30 miles from Fredericksburg, <laughs> right? And Lee's going to want to mass his army in this area. Mm -hmm. And two of his corps commanders, James Longstreet and Richard Yule, um, they're going to get there not long afterwards. They're going to kind of set up this basic command. Now, likewise, Lee's cavalry under the aforementioned Jeb Stuart Mary is going to be, be nearby. Um, he's going to get there around May 20th or so. And he'll be encamped about five miles north of, Cul of Culpeper on the Rappahannock River nearby a place called Brandy Station, okay? Now, in this, this is the thing, is while they're in camp, Lee is gonna make it very clear to Stuart. He's gonna say, I want you to devote this time to rest and drill, okay? Yeah. It's probably around this time where he confided in Jeb he was going into Pennsylvania, because he trusted him. So yeah. it, probably, it probably makes about most sense, okay? Before long, Stuart is gonna end up with just under 10,000 men, spread over five brigades, okay? as well as a brigade of horse artillery. Um, and because what's going to happen is Lee is going to give him two additional uh, horse brigades. Okay, we'll talk yep. about that. Stewart is going to have his normal three brigades, which is Fitzhugh Lee, Rooney Lee, and Wade Hampton. Okay, we'll talk about all those guys in detail. He's going to get two more. He's going to get William Grumble Jones. Okay. Who's and not Beverly, a fan of Stewart at all. No, and, and Beverly Robertson, who equally hates him. Okay. Yep. And he's also going to get horse artillery under the guy's name of Robert Beckham. We're going to talk a lot about him tonight, okay? Because mm -hmm. he's going to be the artillery guy. The, we mentioned more. The thing about Grumble Jones and Beverly Robertson is they don't like each other. I mean, they don't. They, I mean, they don't like Jeb. And Jeb doesn't like them. No. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, Stuart once re once referred to Robertson as the most troublesome man in the army. That's referred to him as. Now it's likely because Beverly Robertson, because he's a fun study. I don't know. If you study him, Mary. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why Stuart didn't, didn't like him is he was engaged to a woman named Flora, who just happened to be the guy he married, Jeb did. So 
Oh, Beverly it's just like Robertson. one of these like McClellan APL things going on here. Be- Beverly, Beverly Robinson dated who will become Mrs. Jeb Stewart. Okay. That's probably where it comes from. Just my guess. Okay. Did Beverly Robertson ever go on a spite march to divorce Jeb Stewart like uh, AP Hill did to McClellan? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but when, when they get into camp with all these troopers, Jeb is going to take Lee's advice and he's going to drill his men. Now, we're going to talk a lot about these, these big grand reviews they do. Okay. On June 5th, Stewart is going to have the second of three. He already had one earlier, but no one really talks about that. And he's going to conduct this big review of his cavalry at a place called Inlet Station, about three miles east of, uh, of Culpeper, right? Now, this, 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 this review had everything, okay? It had pageantry, full of regalia, a Rosewood's clown, <laughs> uh, just artillery fire. It had it, it had it all, okay? And just, just imagine what this thing must have been like. The troops are galloping at full speed, flashing their swords, the band's playing. Um, John Bell Hood's division's there. They're clapping, watching them go. Yeah. And you can only imagine what this thing must have looked like. They marched as, you know, they marched, you know, as proud as you can possibly do on their job as you are when the blizzard machine gets a new filter. How happy, that joy in your face. Right? That is a great moment. Oh, it, it is. Nothing better because it tastes just right. It does. And yet, like, even the men that are there are in awe of what is happening. Um, one of them, a cavalry man from North Carolina, said behind the reviewing stand, there was an audience of admiring ladies and gentlemen from all over the countryside. They saw a magnificent sight, well-groomed horses mounted by the finest riders found on earth, 8,000 cavalry passed in review first at a walk and then at a thundering gallop, they massed horse artillery and fired salutes. Um, Another soldier from a Virginia regiment said it was one of the grandest sights I have ever beheld. So it was quite the thing to see this grand review and the fact that Stuart's doing it, you know, and even though like the funny thing is Lee has been like, make sure you rest. And he's like, okay. I'm gonna well, rest. I mean, let's like, you hold a fucking grand review. Why? Well, well, well. It was part. Of, no, he, was, he wanted to drill him, so it, it, it did play into the, into the game plan. But Robert E. Lee didn't get to witness this one because he's back at his headquarters at the home of a wood of a widow named Sarah Freeman, mm-hmm. and she called her house Eastern View. You know why? Because it faced the east. There, there you go. You Sometimes should be a the detective. Answer. I, I tell me about it, okay? But soon later, Jeb's going to get a message, and it's going to be from Lee. And he's going to he's going to say he personally wants to inspect his cavalry and this will happen the next day. So this is going to be on June 8th now. OK, so Jeb is going to get to do the whole thing all over again. He's going to bring his men back to Inlet Station, this mm-hmm. time for his third grand review and this time under the eyes of Robert E. Lee. Yeah. Right? And oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say just, you know, looking how it's going. So early in the afternoon of the 8th, Lee is going to arrive. He's going to be riding Traveler. And, and uh, he's going to be with William Pendleton, his chief of artillery, as well as James Longstreet and Richard Yule. And they're all going to sit up on some knoll and they're going to watch this, this big show, right? Um, now, just, just, you just got to picture this, the steward in all his glory. Now the yeah. boss is watching, right? So he's, he's you know, steward personally is riding high. I mean, he had the infantry experience at Chancellorsville. Now he's yeah. back on the horses again. He's going to take full advantage of, of, you know, of his boss. Now, Jeb is going to line up all 22 of his regiments, okay? They'll be spaced out and dressed um, by their full by their uh, rank. I mean, he said nine, about 9,500 troops, about 750 officers in full regalia. And this is the height of, of Jeb's success, okay? I mean, you want to talk about a roll of quarters in your pocket. That's what Jeb Stewart was, had in the situation. Right? Well, Captain William Blackford said that Stewart's command was at the zenith of its power at this time. I mean, no, it was no. The thing about it, though, you know who gets caught up in the moment is Lee. Yeah, Lee is going to jump on Traveler, and he's going to ride down up and down the cavalry lines, and they're all all the troopers going to be saluting, cheering, yelling. They said Lee himself was in a great mood. Um, one of Stewart's troopers, he um, he said afterwards, Lee made the blood tingle through the veins of every cavalry. Ooh, Ooh. <laughs> just imagine how that must have been, right? So they're all in the caught in this moment now, right? So they um and, and they they were this is a great Lee said himself was a splendid sight. And when it was over, um he's Lee's gonna order Jeb. He's gonna say, okay, the great show, but tomorrow what I want you to do is I want you to cross over Beverly's Ford, which is one mm-hmm. of the Fords over the Rappahannock, and a place called Welford's Ford, and we want you to screen Yule's imminent movement into the Shenandoah Valley. Okay, that's what he's going to do, okay? Now, I know what you're thinking, Mary. Where the hell's the Union? 
Okay. Well, that's what I was just thinking is I where know. is the union and what's going on with the union? That's where we have to go back to June 7th, 1863, um, where Hooker sends orders to Pleasanton. Pleasanton is, uh, he's an interesting guy. He's leading the union cavalry at this point. Um, and just a bit of background about him. So he's born in Washington, D.C. in 1824. His father uh, is kind of a hero of the War of 1812 um, because he saved crucial documents in the National Archives from being destroyed by the British invaders of Washington. Um, not going to mention the um, country that they actually came from. <laughs> Those British invaders. <laughs> Canada. You were saying? Um, anyway, so he saved the original Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution as, um, from being destroyed by them. Pleasanton graduates from West Point in 1844. Um, he's com commissioned a brevet second lieutenant in the first U.S. Dragoons, which at that, that time, that's the heavy cavalry that they have. So he's out West for a while. He goes to fight in the Mexican-American War. He receives a brev um, brevet promotion to first lieutenant for gallantry at Palo Alto and the Battle of Versaca de la Palma in 1846. By 1855, he's a captain. Uh, the beginning of the Civil War, he transfers to the 2nd U.S. Cavalry Regiment, and he's promoted to major in February of 1862. Uh, it is Lincoln who nominates him um, for promotion to Brigadier General Volunteers, um, which the Senate conf confirms his appointment. Um, so September 2nd, 1862, um, Pleasanton is in charge of, a, he's division commander of cavalry. He ends up getting wounded at Antietam. I think like a, just a shell fight fragment kind of bounces off and hits him in the face or something like that. Um, and he apparently, um, and this is something about Pleasanton. He gives really inflated claims of the battle, makes himself look a lot better than what he is. Um, mm -hmm. He ends up getting himself promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in the regular army. Now, the one thing that he does at Chancellorsville is he exaggerates his performance um, and he claimed to temporarily have halted Jackson, which in turn, he said, com saved the 11th Corps from complete annihilation. Um, Thank God he did that. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> well, and, then, and then Hooker doesn't help matters. He tells Lincoln that Pleasanton had saved the Union Army. So we're talking about a guy that's already got an inflated ego. He doesn't need like Hooker going to Lincoln being like, yeah, this dude, he saved the Union well, Army. The thing about Pleasanton too, is, do you know what, do you know anybody who's always wrong? Just always wrong. Okay. Present oh, company, totally. Excluded, okay. That's <gasps> okay. That's who he was. Okay. He, Have you seen his picture? Like he looks like a guy. Well, I look at his picture and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but he, this is a guy who always seemed to make the wrong choice. He argued with his, his, you know, his uh, subordinates. He's the guy who told Washington there was no Rebs in the Valley the same day Milroy was getting spanked at Second Winchester. So he's just wrong. He's that guy who's always wrong. So but he blames not, we'll, other people. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk more about him in a little bit, but he's, he's somebody, suffice to say, his subordinates, and we're going to talk about them in detail, uh, Greg and, and Buford, they don't respect him. They don't like him. They think no. he's incompetent. He is one of the more underrated incompetents in the American Civil War on the Union side. And you you could pick up. Oh, he's one who doesn't get get enough of get enough credit oh, on the down slope. How he got how he became in charge of the cavalry. I mean, I see it now. You know, it's like Lincoln's promoting him, and then Hooker's going like, oh yeah, he uh -huh. saved the army at Chancellorsville, right? Like no wonder. But on June seventh, eighteen sixty three. Hooker is going to send orders to Pleasanton and he tells Pleasanton basically, okay, use all your mounted units, cross the Rappahannock at Beverly and Kelly's Fords. And these are two Fords that have been used quite heavily during the civil war um, for, well, for well, crossing. Don't, well, don't forget before that, before you get to that point though, you know, th the reason why they did all that is because on the 5th of, of June, we talked about that yep. first review. Okay. They, the Union heard it. So yeah. the Union Cavalry is, is, is this pomp and circumstance going on. John Buford and his two cavalry divisions are not far away across the Rappahannock River. Now, Buford yeah. is going to send that message um, to Joseph Hooker on the 6th. He's going to say, I received info, which I consider reliable, that all available cavalry of the Confederacy is in Culpeper County. And I feel Jeb Stewart is going to raid. And Buford and his men, they hear this big review, okay, specifically the artillery on the 5th. They hear that. And Buford says, I suppose it's a salute, as I was told Stuart was to have uh, was was to have that day an inspection of his whole force. And what's funny about this, one guy told Jeb, maybe we should shut the F up. 
You know who that guy was? Grumble Jones, okay? <laughs> Grumble Jones, he was concerned about Stewart's show for that very reason. Jones would write later on, he said, no doubt the Yankees, who have two divisions of cavalry on the other side of the river, have witnessed from their signal stations this show in which Stewart has exposed to view his strength and arouse their curiosity. They will want to know what is going on. And if I'm not mistaken, we that will be over tomorrow morning to investigate. He said this on the eighth, so he was right. Okay, give him plus one for grumble. Oh, okay? No, okay, you can just see him standing there watching Stewart and like, not this shit again. Well, he just <laughs> they're gonna know just, we're fucking there. And in, 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 in the it's gonna be this intel people guys is gonna be totally straight up. So back at headquarters in Falmouth, Virginia, Joseph Hooker, who is still in charge at this point, he hasn't yep. been replaced yet, is now convinced Stewart is going to raid his supplies and according to uh, Hooker's words, create shenanigans. That's what he says. And mm. he's going to telegraph Washington with this news. Now, he's also getting information from his Bureau of Military Information. This is this mm. is uh, Colonel George Sharp, Hooker's chief of intelligence, is going to yep. also tell him that Stewart's about to get on that ass. That's what he's going to basically tell him, <laughs> okay? So in Hooker's telegram to Washington, He's going to say, I am determined to break up it, break it up in its incipiency. There's a, there's a big word for you. And then Hooker says, I will send all my cavalry against them. It is my intention to attack them in their camp in the vicinity of Culpeper. Now, there's a lot to unwrap with that. Yeah. First he's of determined, all, is he? He's determined. First thing we'll mm-hmm. talk about, they're not in Culpeper. They're in Brandy. That's no. going to be a big deal. Okay. Yeah. But the thing, the thing that's amazing about this is what you talk about at the very beginning, this concept of Hooker going to get them. Okay. Because we talk about the state of the Calvaries at this time. Yeah. Joseph Hooker, in his mind, he's told by Buford and Sharp, the entire Confederate cavalry, the whole shoot match is right across the river. The Calvaries are not at that same level yet. Hooker no. says, screw it. Let's go get them. Okay. And by this point, though, that gap has been closed, okay, between the two cavalries. That perceived huge advantage is not as big as it was. Now, early in the war, there was that distinct advantage in this area we sort of mentioned. A lot of the Southerners were used to riding horses. They had their own horses yep. that they were used to. The North really didn't have that experience. It's a when cultural the war- difference between them because right. the North is so industrial and the, the South was so much more, like, agricultural. But the men, because of, you know, what their economy was based on, they had time to learn how to ride horses and ride them very, very well. And then when, when the war happened, most of the better cavalry commanders went to the South. Mm-hmm. That was the other thing too. Well, even Buford so, was approached to go to the South and he was like, fuck that. Well, who was the, one of the Union's better cavalry guys was U.S. Yeah. Grant. He never really went to the cavalry. No. Nope. Goes to show how that whole thing was going, right? But the organization um, was completely screwed up. And this is where Hooker's organization of the armies really helps them, right? So... At the time before this, the, what it basically was is you had cavalry, they were under regiments and they were attached to infantry at this point. Okay. Mm-hmm. They were primarily used to scout as couriers. And because they were put in regiments, putting them together to raid was pretty much impossible, right? Stuart was the opposite. He uses cavalry in large scale raids that disrupt supply lines and just cause make shit happen. But fortunately for the Union, this Hooker's organization that he changed really benefited the cavalry because what he did, better training, he got rid of the real shitty officers, he got mm-hmm. rid of them all, right? We, we talked about this when we did Fredericksburg a little yep. bit, right? But he put the cavalry into corps, okay? He had them set up with corps. And he had some success initially. I mean, George Stormont shit himself at Chancellorsville. That didn't work. But for the most part- Great way to put it. <laughs> He had, he had some success, but yep. needless to say, Hooker's decision to attack Stewart had balls, okay? Because oh, this it, was their, right? It, it did. And, and this is one aspect that is completely ignored by the Gettysburg folks who started Gettysburg campaign is how much, you know, how much the risk was of him doing this. It was. So, um, but Hooker is not stupid though. He, he, he's not, he's not, he's no. not going to send cavalry at mano a mano. What he's going to do is he's going to send them with infantry and he's not just going to send some random core. He's going to create an all-star team. He's going to yeah. pick 3000 hand picked infantry from a whole bunch of spread throughout the corps. When we talk about these regimental numbers later, you'll see second core, 11th core, third, they're, they're just mixed up in what they are. 
He was bold, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that he couldn't win a straight-up battle, but he thought he could even the odds if he sent not only his infantry, but his absolute A-team infantry. And that's what he did. Yep, exactly. And you're absolutely right. He chooses kind of this all-star team to go in and get them. And I think that shows Hooker's um, talent as as a leader, as, as knowing his men, as being able to do something like that. Um, and I sometimes wonder if, you know, he's trying to kind of redeem himself from Chancellorsville at this point too, but what the plan was, was, um, you know, it's a two-pronged approach. So Buford is going to cross at Beverly's Ford, two miles Northeast of Brandy station. Um, Greg run DMG, as you like to call him crosses at Kelly's Ford, which is six miles downstream to the Southeast. Um, and, but this is where Pleasanton, he's like, he's assuming he's going to catch Stuart in a double en- envelopment, surprise him, outnumber him, and therefore defeat him. This is one of these plans that it's, it's like Fredericksburg. It is perfect on paper. It looks great. But if you don't have an exact awareness of where your enemy is, it, you know, it might not go as you plan. No. And that's the thing is Pleasanton does not know where Stuart is. And he's also assuming that his own force is larger than than what Stuart has. Um, but as we're going to see, this is one where it's like mutual surprise on either side. All right. So here's the here, here, here plan the plan goes. Okay. So on the infantry side, finish up with the infantry for a second. Okay. He's going to have two brigades. Mm-hmm. First brigade is going to be led by, by Adele Bart Ames. We've talked about him a lot. 11th Corps. That angry disciplinarian from Maine who everybody hates. Everybody yeah. hates Adele Bart, right? And he's going to command some, some regiments that are going to be very familiar to the Gettysburg folks. The 86th New York, okay, the 124th New York, the Orange Blossoms, okay, who will be more famous for what they do with the triangular fields uh, in Gettysburg a, a few weeks month later or so. The 2nd Massachusetts, uh, the Mudge people, mm-hmm. and the 33rd Mass, as well as the 3rd Wisconsin, okay. His other infantry brigade is going to be run by a New Yorker, a lesser-known guy named David Russell. He's going to command the 2nd, 7th Wisconsin, the 56th, 81st, and 119th PA, as well as the 5th and 6th New Hampshire. Ever crosses, guys, okay? So you're going to have, these are really good, these are really good regiments. Now, Hooker's plan, you kind of hinted at, is basically in a nutshell this. And you mentioned before, it's a good plan. John Buford, his first cavalry division, because he's in charge of the first cavalry, is going to cross the Rappahannock at Beverly's Ford and move towards Brandy Station, Okay. He'll be accompanied by Ames's infantry brigade, mm-hmm. those guys we just mentioned, as well as the horse artillery of the first, second, and fourth U.S. Okay, it's a pretty good team. Okay, Alfred Pleasanton, okay, is going to be joining them. He's going to be with them as well. Okay, um, with this Buford entourage. Yep. Now the plan is when they get to Buford, to Brandy Station, Buford is going to connect with David McMurtry Gregg's third cavalry division who is going to get there by crossing, like you said, Kelly's Ford with David Russell's infantry, those other guys I mentioned, right? He's also going to have a second cavalry division commanded by a guy named Alfred Dufy. Okay, he's a French guy who's also going to cross Kelly's Ford and ride up to the town called Stevensburg. So he's going to protect Buford and Greg's left flank, okay, as they proceeded to Culpeper together where they expected to meet Jeb's cavalry. So it's kind of like everyone gets the quarterback from two different directions. Mm-hmm. When you meet at Brandy Station, okay, we're going to go to Culpep. We're going to go get Jeb. Yep. That's the plan. This plan is almost exclusively conceptualized to humiliate Jeb Stewart. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the whole point of it. But, the, you know, it's a good plan assuming Stewart, like you said, is where he thinks he is. Yep. There's an old saying I used to hear when I was in school, Mary. That said, man makes plans and God laughs. Yes. It's an old saying, okay? And this is going to prove true because Stuart is not going to be at Culpepper, okay? He's going to be at Brandy Station. He's going to be at that meeting point, okay? So they're both going to get there from separate directions, okay? This is going to result in the most in the largest cavalry battle ever fought in North America, which is going to be pure and utter chaos. And this is going mm-hmm. to be, of course, the Battle of Brandy Station. And that's what we're going to be talking about in detail. And that is our lead up to the Battle of Brandy Station. And so that brings us to June 8th, which you've already talked about the review. Mm -hmm. Um, But the night of June 8th, leading into June 9th, the Union is going to pass a very uncomfortable night since they can light no fires and they eat their rations cold. And Buford's men are basically having to sleep with the reins of their horses looped around their wrists because they could be asked to go at any time. 
And that that's what leads us into the beginning of this battle of Brandy Station. So the day begins early for the Union soldiers, 2 a.m. There's whispered orders that go out and these men are mounting their horses. They keep their horses saddled at night just so it's easy for them to get up and go in the morning. And by 4 a.m. they are ready to go and cross the Rappahannock um, in very dense fog. There's always fog. There's always fog at these so, at these battles when they're crossing. It makes it seem so eerie. Um, I just I, I think back to the sunrise that we just saw at Gettysburg, where we saw that that all that fog, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And so they are going to cross at Beverly's Fort at right four thirty in the morning. About four thirty in the morning, as you like to call it, call me maybe time. Okay. <laughs> right. and Only if I've been at the mine. That's oh God. The first brigade. Okay. Is uh, this is cavalry we're talking about now? The first cavalry brigade is under a guy named Benjamin Davis. Okay, mm-hmm. he's an Alabama of all things, Mary, who stayed with the Union. Okay? Yeah, you don't hear a lot of the Alabama. He's actually, the um, he he was actually good friends with Buford. That's yeah. why he was there. Mm-hmm. And they're going to move towards Beverly's Ford, and his, his uh, Davis's lead regiment is the Eighth New York Cavalry under the command of Edmund Pope. Okay, mm-hmm. they're going to have to move very, very quiet. Okay, they're going to have to move across because it's dark because they know that there are rebel vedettes right across the yep. ford, and they know it. So they try to be quiet, but guess what happens? The vedettes see them. Okay, yep, and they're going to fall back to the picket line. Which is, which is going to be part of the of a company in the 6th Virginia Cavalry under Bruce Gibson, okay? They're going to come running back, and, the, and Gibson is going to find out who is then going to send a message uh, to tell his brigade commander, Grumble Jones, that man again, what he is seeing. Gibson is going to tell his pickets, these guys, okay? The debts fall back to the pickets. Gibson is going to tell the pickets, keep cool, but shoot to kill. He's going to tell them. And he's going to lead that small company forward to slow this oncoming federal cavalry. So just picture these guys quiet as hell working, moving towards each other in the fog and that gray of the morning. Okay. And what's going to happen is this um this picket line is going to fire initial volley right in the faces of the eighth New York and is going to start the ball, what's going to become this battle. Now the eighth is going to be surprised because why the hell wouldn't they? And they're going to fall back and wait for the main body of that cavalry unit uh, of the brigade to get there. And when they do, they inevitably drive this pick a line back from, from Gibson. Okay. Benjamin Davis's his cavalry brigade under Buford. Okay. will put that initial rebel line back one and a half miles past Beverly Ford. They're just going to drive them. Right. And they're going to keep driving until they begin to come upon a battery of rebel artillery near the woodlot. These guys are still sleeping. Okay, when they mm-hmm. all get there. So the Rebs is still in bivouac, meaning they're still in their feety pajamas. This is Cape Cod <laughs> phrase, okay, is what that uh, it's civil war phrase, what that means, okay? Feety pajamas. Um, and, and then they hear, they hear Buford's men coming and they wake up and it's 600 surprise rebels jumping out of their beds all at the same time, running for their nearby horses. Now, uh, the guy in charge of that artillery I mentioned is a guy named Captain James Hunt, okay? Mm-hmm. He's a commander of the South Carolina Washington Artillery. He's going to roll out a gun. And he's just start firing away at these advancing Union cavalry with canister. Okay. Now, eventually, he'll get two guns up there, and, and he's going to basically be firing to buy time for everyone to get up and get get active. Right. At this point, that rebel cavalry um, is going to begin to arrive. Okay, for those Confederates, both literally and figuratively, the cavalry is going to arrive. This is mm-hmm. going to be the Sixth Virginia. Sixth Virginia under a guy named Cabell Florney, okay? He'll have 150 horsemen that are going to show up. Now, a lot of these guys didn't have time to put saddles on their horses. So they're riding no. bareback, you know? And they're also the right riding side. in their, like, underwear and stuff, too. Like, they've maybe no si- time to get saddle. dressed. Who knows what's going on, you know? But they <laughs> literally, they're probably wearing their all together, jumping on a horse <laughs> with, without their saddles. But that's what's happening is they, they just didn't expect it, right? But they had to hustle to slow down these Federals. Now, the 6th Virginia is going to ride full speed, full banana into the 8th New York, okay? And it's going to result in one of those classic cavalry duels with sabers clanging and revolvers being fired at close range. Florida's men are going to push back that 8th New York before more Union horsemen are going to arrive from Davis's brigade, okay? Because you can see the, the different more guys coming in on both sides. Colonel Davis himself will be in the saddle, and he's going to yell to his men, stand firm, 8th New York. He's going to yell at them. And at this point, he's going to turn, and a rebel lieutenant 
named R.O. Allen is going to run up to him from the 6th Virginia. You know what he's going to do? He's going to shoot him right in the face, kill him. Yep. Because he's, he's going to die in the saddle. He ain't gonna Davis only it. has right. a pistol. He's going to, and you know, I don't know if it's ironic or whatever, but, you know, just under a year later, Jeb Stewart is going to share the same fate. Yeah, it's similar. I mean, it's yeah, just, very just similar. You know, and right at that very moment as well. Now Davis is down. Okay, and Devin's going to take over. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah. But at that at that moment, the Rebs are going to get more reinforcements. This time from the Seventh Virginia under Thomas Marshall, and they're going to they're going to show up on the dance floor, as you like to say. Okay. <laughs> um, it was pro- it was probably at this moment where uh, Buford and Pleasanton probably said, "Hey, shit, you know what? They're not on call pepper after all. They're here." Ah. Yeah. Mutual okay. surprise, right? Because even even Stewart is uh, surprised. Uh, one of Stewart's staff said that Stewart was immediately awakened. The alarm sounded throughout the entire headquarters. Servants saddled the horses and everything was made ready for the imminent fight. A few minutes later, Stewart's couriers raced off to wake the troops. This is Major Johann August Heinrich Heros von Bork, Prussian cavalry officer, quite the name arrived in South Carolina via blockade runner. And he's assigned to general Stewart by Confederate secretary of war. Uh Yeah. I just wanted to say his name. (laughs) You you nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. But the (laughs) the sixth and seventh Virginia. Okay. They're going to have to fall back and they're, they're battling. They're doing their best. Um, The feds are going to get more support. It's like one after the other getting supplies and and, and, um, I mean, reinforcements this time it's going to be the eighth Illinois under captain Alpheus Clark. Okay. And, um, as they're falling back, that Hart's guns I mentioned, but those two guns, are, they're kind of buying time. They're firing and just save them a little bit. Um, while this initial part of the battle is kind of underway, there's going to be more horse artillery is going to show up um, under the command that guy mentioned earlier, Major Robert Beckham. Bend it like Beckham, okay? That's who's going to be doing <laughs> that. And he's going to set up on a, on a ridge um, near a house owned by a woman named Emily Gee, near a place called the St. James Church. He's going to set up an ridge mm-hmm. line where he's going to set up his battery. Now, in front of this ridge, okay, now the, the Union has, hasn't got there yet. They're setting up on this ridge. In front of the, the ridge is an open field of 800 yards, just open, okay? And the rebel gunners are going to sit there and they're going to wait for whoever the hell comes out of those woods in this field. They're going to get it, okay? The men who do is going to be that Clark's 8th Illinois, okay, yep. who will appear out of the woods and they're going to get the surprise of their lives because Beckham's artillery is going to immediately hit them harder than a Cleveland Indians pitcher in a playoff game. That's how hard they're going to get hit, okay? I say that because the Indians don't make the playoffs anymore, but that's how <gasps> it was. But they will to, this year. Oh, God, yeah, I'm sure they will. This is the year, you know, undefeated. But while they're under fire of this horse artillery, okay, things are going to get worse for Clark as he's riding down the ridge is going to be that 12th Virginia under a guy named Archer Harmon, mm-hmm. as well as our old friend L- L- Lunsford Lomax. May I remember him? Lomax. Virginia. He's, he's in this, okay? Every time I hear and, that name, I think of Bernie Lomax and Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> don't talk about it. <laughs> and, and then they're going to get the 35th uh, Cavalry Battalion of Elijah White. Okay, so more, more, more guys are coming on the field here, right? <clears throat> now, don't forget, too, Jeb's guys are spread out, too, and they're all kind of coming there all at the same time. <clears throat> the Illinois men are going to get some support from a guy named William McClure, his third Indiana Cavalry, and all hell is going to break loose on that 800 yards of open ground. They're going to hold their own for a while, but they're going to get pushed back. Um, the Virginians are going to basically um, near be- going to fall back to Beckham's artillery on that ridge. It's going to go back and forth and back and forth. And while this is all happening, okay, you know who's not there is Jeb. He's back at his headquarters at a place called Fleetwood Hill, okay? Yeah. Um, and he hears the distant sound of distant artillery, okay, yeah. from near Beverly's Ford. And he's perplexed because he doesn't know what the hell that is. The messengers haven't arrived there yet to tell him what's going on. At that very moment, who which does show up, though, is one of the messengers from Grumble Jones. Yep. And he's, oh, and he's, yeah. And this he's, is and great. He's, well, the, the, he, this, I, know, I know we have talked about this. Is, that's a, a future message when you're talking yeah. about it. But this one just basically says, um, you know, this, this, this is going on. Jeb is going to immediately break camp and is going to blow that conch shell to bring his cavalry down towards Brandy Station, down near around yeah. Fleetwood Hill. He's going to get the brigades of Hampton, we talked about, Fitzhugh Lee, which is being commanded by Thomas Munford at this time, yeah. and Rooney Lee. Mm-hmm. He's going to give them all instructions to haul ass to the sound of the guns. Just yeah. get here. 
And know? that's what one of the uh, one of the Confederate cavalry that was part of that that got the orders to haul ass. He said on June 9th, around 3:30 in the morning, we were suddenly roused from our slumber by couriers racing up excitedly. We'd been sleeping in our tent, partially dressed as usual. They reported our pickets at the Rappahannock had been surprised. So, yeah. so he, he's going to order Beverly Robertson, you know, his old fun lover there, you know, Flora's ex, Bev. To, to head to Kelly's <laughs> Ford because he's going to send him to guard Kelly's Ford because he, he hears everything is coming, you know, with Beverly's Ford, but he says, go to Kelly's Ford and just guard that, which he's going to do. It's obvious now that Jeb's this battle was going to happen in this area on mm-hmm. Jeb's side now too. Okay, it was game on. Is what it was at this yep. point. Now Buford is is you know he's seen the cavalry go, but he knows his ace in the hole is this infantry. So he's going to call the bullpen, and he's going to bring up Adele Bart Ames' infantry. Okay, yep. Ames is going to immediately probably swore a little bit, but he, he finally did it. He's going to bring up that 124th New York, that Orange Blossom Regiment from Orange County, New York, right? And they're going to be under command at this time, not by Augustus Van Horn Ellis, but by a guy named Francis Cummins. Okay, that's mm-hmm. who's going to be in charge at this point. Okay, they were in position in the woods on the west side of the Beverly's Ford Road. Okay, the 86th New York, under a guy named Jacob Lansing, is going to take the spot where on the right side of Beverly's Ford Road. Mm-hmm. Okay, most of that first cavalry under Davis, now he's dead, is going to be set up to the left of the 86 Infantry. So they're setting up a line, okay? Once they're in position, Buford's going to order the 6th Pennsylvania, okay, this is part of Charles Whiting's Reserve Cavalry yeah. now, to charge across that open field in towards those rebel guns at St. James's Church and Emily Gee's house, mm-hmm. okay? Poor Emily, poor Emily. That's, that's just, This is going on yep. right in her house, okay? An officer in that charge is going to say, we dashed at them, yelling like demons. Grape and canister were poured into our left flank and a storm of rebel bullets in our front. So you can just imagine what the hell they're dealing with. They're yeah. Right, right at the guns, right? Exactly. Look, there was, um, from the Confederate perspective, um, Charles Phelps, uh, he's a Southern horse artillerist. He said, I had a fine opportunity witnessing some fine cavalry fighting. Our men charged them into the woods, but they were met by two brigades of inf- infantry and had to fall back. Then the Yanks <sighs> charged our cavalry. I thought at one time I was gone. The fighting being so general, we could, we couldn't use our pieces. Um, and then captain John Hart of the sixth Pennsylvania said, never rode troopers more gallantly as under a shell, as under a shell of fire and shrapnel. And finally of canister, they dashed up to the very muzzles then through and beyond our guns passing between Hampton's left and Jones's right. I mean, you just got to imagine the bravery of these guys, right? Oh, this it's the, crazy. But, but and this, the six Pennsylvania is completely outnumbered. Okay, first of all, they got to have their sabers and pistols going. They're going to charge that battery while being attacked with the 35th, 11th, and 12th Virginia and the freaking guns, right? Yeah. Now, the battle the battle got more intense. The Pennsylvania men are going to get supported, though, by the 6th U.S. Cavalry. And it's going to be absolute pandemonium right in front of Beckham's guns. Just freaking imagine, it's right? It's crazy. And Buford One, will credit the 6th PA um, with uh, stabilizing his left with what they did. Oh, absolutely. One of the rebels who was at the guns, he talked about this moment and this mm-hmm. battle right in front of his face. He writes, hundreds of glittering sabers instantly leaped from their scabbards that gleamed and flashed in the morning sun and then clashed with that metallic ring searching for human blood while hundreds of little puffs of white smoke gracefully rose in the balmy June air from discharging pistols. Sounds like a morning in Goddard. But regardless. <laughs> Saturday morning. So I'm telling you about it. But so he's right in the guns. And you just imagine that the, the, the hellfire and that misery, right? Eventually, this onslaught is going to get too much for the Federals. And they're going to have to fall back to their lines. Now, more Confederates or reinforcements are arriving. Because don't forget, Jeb blew that conch shell to attract yeah. run for the guns. So they're all getting there. At different points. This is when Wade Hampton is going to show up. And he's going to be the one who's going to change, is going to be the game changer here eventually towards the end. Hampton's brigade is going to show up and they're going to get set up to the right of Grumble Jones, right at that Gee house. Jeb Stewart himself is going to also arrive right around this time. And yep. about two and about two hours of just hard fighting, intense, swinging back and forth. Buford's made it about a mile into Culpeper County. That's how slow this is going. Davis is now dead. Okay, Benjamin Davis. The brigade is now going to fall, like I said, to Thomas Devon. Yeah. And then they're going to realize pretty quickly how outnumbered they were 
when they see Hampton's guys and they realize, oh shit, now we're in for it. Yeah. So in in position, Hampton is good at this point. Hampton's going to see it too, and he's going to go on the offensive, but he's going to send his guys dismounted at Devin's guys who are also dismounted, and who are going to be set up on Buford's left, and they're going to go at it right there. Rooney Lee, he's there. He's gonna all. He's also just recently arrived. You can see how these guys are coming and coming, and just see these more horses coming. Imagine how loud it must have been. All these horses, but yeah, it would have been this. I mean, I can't imagine how loud a cavalry battle would be. No, like just no. like you, you don't just have the artillery. You have like the like thousands of horses, like their hoofs thundering on the ground and all that too. Right? It's gonna oh, be big crazy. Time. You know, you know, Rooney Lee. He, you know, he's gonna get there. He's gonna get there on the dance floor. He's gonna set up just north of Jones along a stone wall between a place called the Cunningham farm and the green farm. Mm-hmm. So they're going to set up a line there. Um, he's also going to set up some artillery under William Graham to fire in those rebel guns. Um, this is, this is the union. Now they're going to file rebel guns on that Ridge under Beckham. So this is going to kind of turn into an artillery duel here a little bit too. This thing, this battle has it all. It really, really does. Yep. It's not even 11 o'clock in the morning yet. This is going on No. So by, by 1130 in the morning, they've been fighting for almost six hours. Okay. Buford all along is looking around lighthousing, okay, looking from left <laughs> to right, and he wants to know what the hell, where's Dave McMurtry Greg? I could really use him right now. Okay? <laughs> so he's gonna he's finally gonna get there, okay? But unfortunately for Buford, you know, he's gonna basically the, the failure to drive back the ribs on the plateau of St. James Church is really gonna put a crimp in the dick of his plans, is what it's really gonna do, okay? <laughs> and we're gonna talk about this in. Timing wasn't on Greg's side either. <laughs> we're no. going to talk about this, but we said he was late. And what happened, what's going to happen? He got delayed, okay, at the very beginning because he was waiting for Alfred Defee's second cavalry um, to show up, who, of course, naturally got lost because that's how this thing tends to work. I on pulled a Lou Wallace, Cal- apparently. It. Actually, I should say that about Lou Ford, they, had to, they had to backtrack and find their way, okay? Yep. Defee didn't make it to, for- make it to the Ford until just before six o'clock in the morning the battle's already going okay and he's finally going to get there with greg and they're going to able to move forward to meet up with buford that's the plan they had an easier time crossing because nobody was focused on it yet there was really nobody there um you know grumble jones really or they hadn't really got to the ford yet for whatever reason yeah. and they finally do get across um it's going to take over three hours to get the, everyone over the river for some reason so they're slow i mean it's like mary speed you know <laughs> and once they do okay. get across once once they do get across they're still about seven miles from brandy station yeah but br- here's the thing though greg can hear the guns from saint james church he can hear them unlike jeb stewart who said go to the sound of the guns you know what greg does he says let's stick to the freaking plan forget yep. the guns Let's go to the original plan. We're going to take the road to Brandy Station, and we're going to send Defee, just like the plan. We're going to send him up to Stevensburg, yep. just like it was going to go, to protect Greg's flank while he's riding along. And he's going to – him and David Russell are going to be riding towards – not the guns, but towards Brandy, Brandy – um, towards Brandy Station, rather. I'm yep. blank for a second. And it's funny because Grubble Jones is going to get wind of Greg crossing at Kelly's Ford. And this is a message you talked about, okay, before, okay? Yeah. Greg, Grumble Jones is going to find out Greg's crossing because he was sent down there to, to Kelly's Ford. And he's going to send a message to Stuart warning him of his latest threat. He's going to, and he's going to tell me, not for nothing, but there's more friggin' guys coming, okay? Stuart's going to reply to the courier, tell Jones to, to attend to the Yankees in his front and I'll worry about the flank, which was a dickhead comment to Jones yep. basically saying, worry about yourself. I, I got this. Just worry about you. So Jones, of course. It's like F call, him. Well, they call him Grumble Jones for a reason. He's just no, not He's a nice like, fuck, just, fuck just fuck one, one, one of those guys. This is low beer lights always on. He's miserable, you know. But he's going to get that message. He's going to get pissed off. And don't forget, they hate each other. He is said to have said, so he thinks they aren't coming, huh? Well, let him alone then. He'll damn find out soon for himself they're coming. That's the message he says to the car. That's, the, that's you know what? the fuck him message. He's like, you know what? Screw him. I'm not going to tell him. Good luck, Jeb. And, and the horse you rode it on, literally. That's yeah. what he's going to say to him, okay? Defee's second division is approaching Stevensburg, just like it's ordered, around 1130 in the morning, led by the 6th Ohio under Benjamin Stanhope, okay? He's told by Defee, 
to hold the town, but retreat slowly if he can't hold mm-hmm. it. Whatever, yeah. whatever the hell that means. He's going to send some skirmishes ahead into the first Massachusetts cavalry. Soon later, the Rebs are going to begin to approach from the north because they're all coming. Men from Matthew Butler's second South Carolina, guys from like William Wickham's fourth Virginia cavalry, they're all going to start coming in, right? That first mass under control of a guy named Greeley, Greeley Curtis, okay? And they're able to push back those initial Rebs who are kind of being led by Frank Hampton of all people, which is the, which is the uh, younger brother of Wade Hampton. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, it turns into a rout. The unions are chasing these guys. And the union guys called it a great steeplechase, they called it, right? Yeah, that was amazing, that quote. You know, but Butler's second South Carolina is going to make one final stand and try to knock and try to knock back uh, Butler. And he, they will. Butler is actually going to lose a foot in the process. He's going to get hit with a foot for whatever reason. DeFee is going to be ready to attack again when he gets a message from a courier now and tells him, get your ass to join Greg's third division on the road to Brandy Station, ASAFP. Okay, mm-hmm. that's who's going to tell him. Because the battle's on. They're like, you know what? we, we got to get you to Brandy Station. This is, this is where the action is. So back at that plateau where the St. James Church is, okay, Buford is going to come to the reality that he ain't going to be able to take this ridge. No. It ain't going to happen. He knows no. he can't. No, he, he's kind of like, I, and he tells Pleasanton, I can't do any more than what i've done at all um he's like he's been remaining on the defensive since pleasanton had been consi- pleasanton had actually been considering withdrawing uh since shortly afternoon mm-hmm. but finally buford has to say to him like no more like well, we, he, we can't do this he knows the plan isn't going to work so he's going to yeah. try to cobble together one more thing okay mm-hmm. well, he's going to basically try to create a new this is buford now Okay, it goes to show how Pleasanton's looked at. Buford's calling the shots at the situation, right? Yeah. He's going to try to move half of his force around to hit Stewart's left flank. He's like, that's the best I can do. Dave McMurtry, Greg, okay, is going to now begin his own fight near Stewart's headquarters at Fleetwood Hill near Brandy Station. Yeah. Um, as soon as Jeb could get another message, um, would he get, he get, Jeb's going to get another message, okay? This time it's going to be from one of his aides named Major McClellan to warn him of Greg's arrival, okay? This is all going on kind of simultaneously. That's why it's, this is a kind of a confusing battle. It is. But at the, at the foot of Fleetwood Hill was a single gun. It was a Napoleon under the command of John Carter, we mentioned, who was part of Roger Chew's Virginia battery. Now, Carter is going to place the gun on the top of the hill, and he's going to fire on Greg's approaching horseman. Yep. And as soon as he fires, it slows Greg down because now they got to deploy, they got to go into battle formation. It's very similar to the beginning of, of not Knox on Ridge at Gettysburg. One shot with the Confederates, two yep. hours. It was very similar, but in reverse, right? By doing so, Carter is going to buy time that it took, you know, because Greg had to set up. Now, moments later, another courier is going to get to Jeb, okay? He's kind of like the other couriers with a message saying, hey, guess what? The Yankees are a brandy station. And so, well, Stewart's going to order the brigades of Grumble Jones and Wade Hampton to Brandy now, okay? Yep. And so Greg is continuing to assault Fleetwood Hill uh, with Percy Wyndham's second brigade, men from Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, guys like that. But Clellan, he's there. He knows he needs help, especially when Carter's gun inevitably has to withdraw. It's, you know, it's one gun, right? Yep. He's going to get help from the 12th Virginia, who rode full speed again, this time into the first New Jersey, okay? And it's going to lead to, again, that close range, saber clanging cavalry fight, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Wyndham's men are going to get the upper hand again versus those, self, uh, those uh, 12 Virginia guys. And they're going to be joined by the 35th Virginia again, who seemingly is everywhere, okay? They and they're going, to, they're going to drive those Union guys back, right? Um, now, you mentioned before um, Major Harrells von Bork. Your, your, your guy, that's a God, I can't guy, believe okay? I managed to say his name correctly. Uh, I mean, you know, he's using it well. So he, he's, ta- he's talking about how the heights of Brandy, um, yep. where the head, headquarters was, that they could see the Yankees. So he's, he's just fun to get his name in there, right? But at, th- but at this point, it looks like a rout, okay? And now Florida's men are going to return again. These are the troopers that six Virginia from the very beginning. Yep. They're going to come back, you know, Florida part two, the search for Curly's gold. Okay? They're back <laughs> now, okay? And they're gonna, they've been fighting at St. James Church all this time. Now they're coming back to fight back here. And those troopers, they're gonna fight against those first New Jersey guys. These are these are Virgil Broderick's guys, okay? 
And they fight so hard. The first New Jersey is going to lose their battle flag three times. And you know oh what's going to happen? They're going to recover it. Guess how many times? Three times. Three times. They're going to lose it three times. They're going to get it three times. Okay. Broderick himself is going to be killed in this, in this aspect of it all. Um, now, the battle at this point is kind of all centered on this Fleetwood Hill now. Okay. It's kind of all concentrating there. The feds are going to set up a battery under Joseph Martin. This is the New York Light Artillery. Mm -hmm. And the guns are going to finally push back Florence, those six Virginia guys. They're going to drive them back um, towards that hill again. And this is going to go on and on and on. Um, Martin did eventually have to fall back himself after three of his guns were basically lost. Yeah. Um, he lost, when it was all said and done, out of his 36 artillerists, only six unscathed. He lost most of his horses to this, this artillery guy. Um, when Martin does bail, the Rebs are going to replace those two batteries on Fleetwood Hill, and they're going to begin to fire away at the Yankees now. Mm -hmm. This is when the this is when the numbers are really starting to take control of this, right? Greg is going to order now on the new the, his his new um, commander of his first brigade, our old Fred Judson Kilpatrick of all people. Here man. comes Kilpatrick. Here comes Kilpatrick. Okay? I love this part of the battle. <laughs> now, he, the thing about Kilpatrick is he's fresh. He hasn't fought yet. Okay. Yeah, and he's excited. And, you know, one of Kilpatrick's men of the 10th New York Cavalry, he's going to say, the rebel line that swept down on us came us in splendid order. What followed was indescribable, clashing and slashing, banging and yelling. Okay, so that's there you go. And so the line that he was talking about that came bearing down on them, this is going to be that counterattack by Wade Hampton's Cobb's Legion, okay? Mm -hmm. Those Georgians under uh, Pierce M.B. Young. That's who's going to be coming down on these guys, right? They're going to hit the 10th New York very, very hard, drive them back. Hampton's men, primarily that first South Carolina Cavalry, is able to drive another one of Kilpatrick's regiments, the second New York back. Um, in a union, and they're going to get around that Union flank. When they get around the Union flank, that's kind of the writing on the wall. This whole thing's almost over. Yeah. Um, seeing this, Kilpatrick is going to is going to go to his go-to regiment. Okay. Yeah. And this is the fabulous first Maine. Those hard fighting yeah. lumberjack and fisherman from Maine <laughs> under, 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 under Calvin Doughty. Okay. This is amazing. Now the sixth, the, the first Maine was, you don't hear a lot about the first Maine. You just don't, but they were the, one of the elite cavalry regiments in the United States army. Okay. They just were, they are going to charge that six for Virginia and they're going to temporarily stabilize the field pretty much themselves. But the problem was, like I mentioned before, Greg had his flank turned. Okay, so no matter what the main guys were going to do, the jig was kind of up. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they were all forced to retreat from Fleetwood Hill at this point. And once they did that, Hampton's guys are going to secure the heights and they're going to take have the high ground. Buford pretty much at this time was was kind of having some success fighting there against guys like because Rooney Lee and Pleasanton yep. uh, was basically wanting him to play defense at this time. But Buford is like, ah, no, you know. Um, he's he what he sees there's there's a there's a wall okay and behind the wall is the 10th Virginia Cavalry okay Buford sees them and he wants to attack them okay and he doesn't have the authority over the infantry okay so he basically asked Charles Mudge's second Massachusetts in Martin Flood's third Wisconsin hey if you guys aren't doing anything you want to go charge those guys I can't tell you to but if you want to knock yourselves out. And they of did course. because they said that Buford had such a business-like manner and they really <laughs> respected him that they were going to do it, which I think is a testament to, to Buford's leadership skills. They try, but it was a, you know, it was a bad idea, bad idea, Gene situation. They got, <laughs> they got pushed back pretty quick. They, they really, really did. Buford has one last ditched effort to try to salvage this thing. He's going to send his second U.S. Cavalry under Wesley Merritt. Okay. We, we hear about him later in the, in the Gettysburg campaign to try to take out those Rebs behind that wall, that mm -hmm. 10th Virginia Cavalry, right? They have some success, but the Rebs counterattack and they fell back to the, the Union guys fall back to their lines. By then they've been fighting all day. They're just about out of gas. Um, Buford claimed that you know after the battle, um, they made it to the Heights and they could see Brandy Station, but then at the peak of it, they got attacked by Hampton and they got driven back, which is probably not true. But what's funny is speaking of Wesley Merritt's story, so Wesley Merritt, here are these, these fantastic stories in these battles. He's going to be riding along with one of his aides, and they're going to stumble into a bunch of Confederate officers. They're going to ride right into him, okay? Merritt's quick thinking. 
he pretends to be a reb and his aide is his, is his captain. Well, I got me a Yankee, right? <laughs> the aide's probably like, fuck, what, you know? And unfortunately, one of the Confederate officers is Rooney Lee, who knows Merritt. He's like, I know you. He pulls his sword out and swings Merritt's head, knocks his oh, head off. Oh, is right? Yeah, it takes his hat right? off. This is where he loses, and Merritt's like, loses his head. It, so, you, somehow, dude. so somehow Merritt takes off and he gets away, which is kind of funny. He tries to, I got me, he goes, I don't you've got yours. I know who you wow, are. Wow. So he tried to do yeah. a Phil Carney. But he went to a guy he knew and he, and he, <laughs> and he cost him his hat. So I don't know if you guys love our hats, right? But but like I said at the a little while ago, in the end, when, uh, Hampton's, you know, Legion, the Cobb, all those Hampton guys, those brigades really tipped the scales up for the Confederacy in this battle. And there's nothing the Union guys could do. Um, the feds pretty much gave up the fight at this point. And this is really where the Battle of Brandy Station is going to end, the largest cavalry fight mm -hmm. in, in North America. By 5 p.m., Alfred Pleasanton um, decided enough was enough. He's going to order his men to withdraw and recross at Beverly's Ford. The funny part about it is they did so, and the Rebs didn't pursue him. They were like, let him go, let him go. No, they didn't. They were tired, too. And it's funny, so we're going to go back to... Major Heros von Bork again, and he said, oh. "Thus ended one of the greatest cavalry battles of modern times." Yeah, he was right. At the end of the Somehow day, Van the, Bork has been the spokesperson in this episode. I don't know, you know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, Albert Pleasanton's going to lose about nine hundred guys, but Jeb's going to lose about about six hundred. Yep. And 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 we'll talk about the ramifications. But it's so funny. You mentioned early with Pleasanton, right? Mm -hmm. He you know he was saying that. They would have won the battle, but all of a sudden this train showed up and all these Confederate infantry jumped oh, off the train. He's all trains. pessimistic. But 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 he just made he just made it up that it's never happened. But he just he's he just said he just he, he exaggerates it for lack of a better phrase, oh, right? The greatest quote I read about him was from Sears in Gettysburg, where Sears said that, you know, Pleasanton um went transmuting his role at Brandy Station from lead into gold. <laughs> I was like, I could not have said it better. Like, there's no way anybody could say it better than Sears wow, <laughs> with, with that lead into gold. But here's the thing. Theoretically, this was a Confederate victory. I mean, just on yeah. paper it was. Yeah. But what it did is it showed both armies that the perceived gap in the Union and Confederate uh, cavalries was not this chasm they thought it was going to be. The it Union had, clo had, really, had probably closed the gap at this point. I, what it I did, think it had. It, it really took a little bit of the shine off of Jeb Stewart's halo in the Confederacy is what oh, it really, really did. It, it did because yep. like he took a lot of criticism for this, especially from the media. You know, the media is having headlines that say puffed up cavalry, neg negligence and bad management. Um, Stewart does congratulate his staff on the victory, but some in the Army of Northern Virginia questioned whether Brandy Station had actually been a victory. Uh, General McClaws said our cavalry were, su were surprised yesterday by the enemy and had to do some desperate fighting to retrieve the day. The enemy were not driven back, but retired at their leisure, having accomplished, I suppose, what they attend intended. Um, and that's General McClaws writing, writing that to his wife. I mean, the Union does not, I mean, Pleasanton fails in what he's supposed to do in his orders from Hooker. But I think McClaws is right somewhat in that you know, they obviously the Confederates are surprised and well, they, they the were. Union are starting to hold their own as a cavalry finally. But, but you know what, though? Not only do they know it, but the Confederates units. Remember McClellan I talked about? his. Yeah, he's got so a he, really good quote. He's, he's, he's going to write um, right after the battle. Up to this time, confessedly inferior to the Southern horsemen, they gained the Union on this day the confidence in themselves in their commanders, which enabled them to contest so fiercely the subsequent battlefields, okay? Um, Charles Smith, okay, the guy from the first May we mentioned earlier, he wrote 1885 about this battle. He says, um, and this is, this is when they're talking about the importance of Brandy Station, okay? Um, a higher value attaches to Brandy Station. The rebel cavalry had been in the ascendancy, but Brandy Station broke its spirit. It lost its prestige there and never regained it afterwards. It was the beginning of the end of the war. That's this. That's what that. That's how important these guys felt at the time. Mm -hmm. But not only that, it was the first battle that would prove to be that Gettysburg campaign. Now, when we talk about these later battles, the cavalry, East Cavalry Field. 
you want to talk about the retreat. Yeah. The reason why this, the union had success, okay, in East Calvary Field with Custer and all these guys, okay, was because of what happened to Brandy, because they knew they could swing. It's like you're a football team and you're playing yep. a, 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 a big favor, okay? And you lose, but you lose by that much. You know, exactly. you know we, we can play with these guys. And yep. that's what it was. And it taught them um, it taught them that that they could do it. But not only that, what it did though, it it it, it it really showed the people who fought at Brandy Station. It showed how important it was. Now, this and don't forget too. They look at Brandy Station as Gettysburg, the whole thing, right? When it came time after the war for the Sixth Pennsylvania to dedicate their monument at the battlefield at Gettysburg, okay, this is this is afterwards. Yeah. Colonel Newhall, he's going to address the crowd at this monument. He's going to write, from my point of view, the field of Gettysburg is far wider than it which is enclosed in this beautiful landscape about us. And while Gettysburg is generally thought of as a struggle that began on July 1st, the fact will someday be fully recognized that it is the beginning many miles from here, Beverly's Ford, then that Gettysburg was inaugurated, okay? So hmm. this is what this is saying is, is people, and let's be honest, people overhype Gettysburg. They just do, okay? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a big battle and you can say whatever you want about it, but it's but these guys are true. The reality was, is it was during this campaign, the Gettysburg campaign, that the Union Cavalry came to age, and the rebel dominance in that saddle, uh, it really changed the outcome of the war going forward. It and did. It's for some reason it's just not appreciated. It's just not. It's not, and I mean, even um, yeah, Thor. I, I shouldn't apologize for mentioning him, but Howard had had said <laughs> said something similar. Um, he said this conflict mainly a cavalry engagement at the beginning of the campaign, hard as it seems to have been, was of decided advantage to our cavalry for under good leadership, it had been able to take the offensive and hold its own against equal, if not superior numbers of the well-handled and enterprising Confederates. And this is a guy like Howard is writing, like, you know, coming off Chancellorsville that um, he had entered the fuller understanding of the meaning of the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So I think the Brandy Station, you know, not is just something that, you know, Howard is saying this made our cavalry. This is where we finally are shining. It brought back that kind of morale boost that the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac needed at that time after Chancellorsville, that this and was what a it does, thing for them. And what it shows, too, we talk about those building blocks, right? Yeah. Where the previous generals built this whole success was had because how Hooker reorganized. Exactly, right? yep. You know, he, he, he reorganized. Stoneman did his thing at Chancellorsville. It didn't do very well with that, but it was, it was an effort to, to do a raid. By putting him into cores, it allowed them to get better trained, better officers. So when the time came, Hooker felt he was confident enough, albeit by taking some 3,000 infantry guys anyway, that yep. he could send his horsemen at Jeb Stewart at the height of his, of his success. Yeah, and he pulled it off for the most part. He did. He did. Yep. And what happens comes what, what comes later with, with 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 going forward with the rest of the campaign and beyond. It gave him that confidence. So when Buford goes to Gettysburg, he's able to get good intel. He's able to fight with confidence. Um, and what it did is it showed them that 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 perceived, you know, that fatal flaw in the Union Army, which was the cavalry, was no longer a fatal flaw. Yep. That they were equal to and eventually they're going to in some battles are going to get the upper hands on them. they are so again brandy station is a battle that needs to be studied as part of the gettysburg campaign because if you really want to understand gettysburg especially the east calvary field part of it in the horse part of it at the beginning um even the conference of like an elon farnsworth type situation um you have to understand um Brandy Station, because that's exactly. where they—that's what—that's where they got their their confidence. That's that's where they they got their chops. Yeah. So I think I think it's I think it's a good discussion. We could probably drop it here. I think. And, yeah. And kind of move on from it. But I think it's a good it's a good lesson that they it the is. Union Army. We've talked before. They learned with every step along the way. And as much as you want to have fun with the Hookers and the McClellans and the Burnsides, every one of them built a little bit more to that foundation yeah. that became that Army of the Potomac. And so you, you, as, the, as the, the war continued, you had more men, more material, you had all that, but now you had skills that were equal to and who they probably never, ever suspected they could match the horsemen of the South, but exactly. they sure they could. And, that, that's, and that's why 
some of these these quotes talk about the war being over. That was the one advantage the, the Confederacy had in the Union's Union got them on it. And that was pretty much the end of the deal. So exactly. That's that. so, and that that's what basically Howard's quote is saying is that, you know, they held their own, you know, they, the, this cavalry held their own. And, and the one thing that you have to remember in this is to that uh, General George Gordon Meade is going to inherit this army, the Potomac, including the cavalry, which is going to win Gettysburg. And that is because of what Joseph Hooker has done as well. You have to keep that in mind. And that's why Hooker is one of the men who is named as one of the victors of Gettysburg yep. because of it his organization and, and like his, you know, how he was able to put together this all-star team, um, you know, with infantry selecting certain brigades that he thought are going to shine in this battle that will become Brandy Station. And I think this is a, like, you know, Battle of Brandy Station. Um, I mean, yeah, Pleasanton is <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, why are you in charge of the cavalry? It's a good thing. He had great subordinates like Greg and, and Buford, but it also shows hooker's talent, uh, and being able to select regiments to go into a battle that he knows are going to be strong as well. It does. It does. So what's coming up for us next, Mary? Have we figured out yet? So, um, we are having our round table next Wednesday, June 15th at 7 PM. We have to push, push it back a little bit later. Than what we usually do, but it will be at 7 p.m. on June 15th. Um, invites are going to go out this weekend. Uh, if you've never attended before, info at civilwarbreakfastclub.com. It's via Zoom. We will send you an invite for that. Um, we are talking about doing an episode about Tullahoma, um, as well as about John Hunt Morgan, as well at some point. Uh, and we will see what happens with that. But I think Tullahoma and Morgan will probably be some upcoming episodes for us. Yeah, definitely watch this spot. We will uh, we will figure it out when she tells me what we're doing. So that's how we're going to do it. That's okay. usually how it rolls. Okay. All right. So any final words from you, Fincheru, before we jump off? Well, thank you, first of all, to all our listeners, especially to um, like all of you for supporting us through these 85 episodes. Um, we were able to meet a few of you in Gettysburg. Uh, thanks again to John Heckman of Tattoo Historian for having us on his live stream at the Gary Owen, as well as to the crew from Addressing Gettysburg, Matt Callery and Veronica and Eric uh, for having us on their uh, Addressing Gettysburg today while we were, were there. Be sure to check out those two podcasts, Addressing Gettysburg and Tattoo Historian. Uh, and thank you to you, Darren, for being an amazing co-host. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Happy member of the team, Mary. You know how it is over here. <laughs> In the Northland. So, all right. <laughs> all right. So, everybody, thanks. So, again, thanks for listening, everybody. We really appreciate it. We'll catch up with you soon. We'll see you at our next live, see you at our next round table, and we'll do our next episode when she tells me what we're doing. So, that's what we're going to do. You know, it's, it's fine. I don't care. It is what it is. So, yeah, this was your idea, Brandy Station. Yeah, I know that, but I'm, the next one, I don't know what we're going to do. We have to figure it out. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. We'll anyway, so thanks for joining, everybody. Have a safe uh, end of the week. Have a safe weekend. Hopefully you can join us at our live and our round table and uh, go from there. And one last thing, Mary, go Celtics. Go Celtics. Apparently we use bad language up here in the crowd and California people don't like it. Oh, well. Well, fuck it's oh, well. Boston. They should get used to it. Whatever. The same Cleveland, the same Toronto. You're playing in a real city. That's <laughs> state, so. Sorry. It's true though. It is. It is. I don't know how it's going to play out, but it's, it, it's fun to watch them get pissed off. All right. So off we go. Mary, we'll talk to you soon again. Once again, the pleasure as always is always yours. And we will talk to you on the other side. See y'all later. Peace out. Bye. <laughs>